and um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come down. Um, I'm a little bit like Richard. Um, this is definitely not um, my comfort zone standing up here talking to you guys. I was talking to Richard a bit earlier and, and I said one of my greatest fears um, when I was went through school was public speaking and it, it took me quite a while before I'd actually have the, you know, the courage to get up in front of people. Um, I think that's maybe a little bit of, to do with some of, you know, brought up on a farm all my life and, you know, you don't, you don't see heaps of people. So, um, yeah, so look, it's a privilege to be here um, and look, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come down and talk a little bit about, um, about what, what we do. Um, so just briefly, just going to do a bit of an introduction um, to myself um, and talk a little bit about Whangara Farms, um, talk a little bit about a, a McDonald's flagship farm type program that we've been part of, um, and then talk a little bit about some of the pressures and challenges um, that, that we face. So yeah, I'm um, obviously yeah, married to Karen, my wife's here, she's come down today with me, which is great, um, three kids. Um, I've had a passion for farming pretty much my whole life. It's the only thing I've really ever wanted to do. Um, I've worked in the agriculture industry for the last 27 years. Um, been managing sheep and beef farms for about 22 years. And um, yeah, before that, I had a Bachelor of Agriculture in, um, at Massey University. I was actually born in Christchurch, so I'm actually South Islander. Um, parents still live in Marlborough. Um, I always envisioned that I'd go to Massey, I'd get my um, bachelor, and then I'd come back and I'd go and manage a big high country farm in the South Island. Um, yeah, it didn't quite turn out that way. Um, we ended up sort of getting further and further north, and, and now we're in Gisborne. Ha have a pretty pretty cool sort of um, location. I mean, I think sometimes you know farmers don't really appreciate their surrounds until you sort of sometimes have a little bit of a moment of clarity when you you know, you knee deep in crap somewhere trying to do something and you look up and, and that's the sort of view that you can you can get and it's and it's pretty special and so um, we live in a pretty special part of the part of the world. Um, so Fongara Farms um, is just north of Gisborne. So you can see Gisborne there with a the little arrow and Fongara is between sort of Gisborne and Tolaga Bay on the east coast. I probably need to change this slide. They've actually changed the international date line, so Samara is actually the first place to see the sun now, and we're the second. So, um, yeah, I probably need to change that one. Um, at Whangara, I don't know if you've ever watched the movie Whale Rider. That's where Whale Rider was filmed, and um, and the logo on the shirt is um, is Paikia riding on the whale. So that's sort of our logo um, for Whangara Farms. So what I thought I'd do is just talk about Whangarei Farms now, just briefly over a couple of slides, and then I'm actually going to go back in time to 12 years ago and, um, and what we were like 12 years ago and just sort of work our way through. Um, so, yeah, as Richard mentioned, uh, 8,500 hectares. We're a partnership of three Marion corporations, um, and we have 2,500 shareholders. The shareholding, without, it can get quite complicated, but basically the shareholdings is divided up based on the, um, the value of your agricultural asset that you bring into the partnership. And so that's the shareholding, 55%, 30%, 15%. There's three representatives of the three Marion corporations are on the board. And then what is quite unique about Whangara Farms from a, a Marion perspective is that we have two independents on those boards to manage the farms. Um, so that, to myself, the general manager and the staff, as the general manager and the board, we manage the farms as a, as a farming business. Um, and then those profits are returned to the partners based on their shareholding. And then those three partner committees determine the dividend and then manage the, the basically the cultural and the social needs of their shareholders. So they determine how much that money they then distribute to their, to their shareholders as dividend or how much they retain to then deal with social and cultural issues. So it's quite a different uh, model, but it's, it's been extremely um, successful for us. Um, 75,000 stock units, 17 full-time staff. Um, farming's actually easily, easy. Dealing with people, both in staff and governance, is actually the hardest thing. That, that I've faced. Um, and I think that's the same in, in, in a lot of different businesses as well. Um, we are sort of fully integrated with our systems um, and you know, we have 140% lamb, lambing and a 94% calving. We're completely troughed and reticulated across the whole 8,500 hectares. So water systems, all troughed, reticulated. Um, Romney ewes, Angus cows. Every, we have 35,000 ewes, they're all EID tagged. Um, and so we do quite a bit of, uh, a bit of monitoring um, both, um, both in a mob basis, but all individual as well. Um, last year was $480 per hectare EFS, so around $4 million. Um, 
I guess the big driving force for Whangara farms is that it's, it's sustainability. So the land, it's Maori land, it can never be sold. Um, so every decision we make is, is really based around how sustainable that decision is moving forward. A vision of being an outstanding business, um, delivering sustainable returns to our shareholders. I guess this little statement's really what's probably driven driven me and driven the business over the over the last 12 years. Um, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you've always got. So if we go back to um, 2007 when I started, um, you know, Fongara Farms was was a lot was a lot smaller, um, 5,000 hectares, running 30,000 stock units. It was, it was made up of four really independent farms that were trying to run together but weren't. So they were completely um, sort of independent. Really traditional policies, 100% uh, laving, 85% carving. Uh, we had dams for stock water. Um, we had seven different bull breeds represented in our 2,500 cows. Um, so we had everything. So if you, you name a bull breed, we had it there. Um, except probably the, the longhorns, we didn't have any of those there. Um, we had no stock weighing facilities um, at all, so we couldn't weigh anything. Um, and we had a $72 a hectare EFS, um, so we weren't making a lot of money. Um, that last little statement there, um, boy, this is as good as, it's gonna, as it gets and you're not going to do any better, that was um, told to me by the, the outgoing general manager um, who was retiring. He was 70, and he, he lined me up, and that's what he said to me. And I, I mean, I... I, unless you actually are a, a young boy, being called boy is probably um, probably the worst thing you can get called, I, I reckon. <laughs> um, and in, in the way he said it too, and I think that was something that sort of lit a bit of a fire in me around, um, yeah, I, I actually I think I can do better. So um, we're going to have a crack at it, and that's pretty much what we um, what we did. I just like this because that, that was sort of what was happening. We were just doing the same thing, or well, they were just doing the same thing over and over again and sort of expecting to actually get to get something to happen, but and expecting different results, but it just wasn't. So we, we sort of looked at, I, I had the advantage of coming in from the outside and, and I just looked at the whole big, the big, big farming business. So the, at that stage it was um, 5,000 hectares. And we just looked, at, I looked at the whole thing as one big farm and how, how we could best manage it. And really we focused on those key things around the land. So, so water was, was an issue and I'll, and I'll touch a bit more on that. But we also focused on fertiliser. Um, subdivision drainage, weeds, and uh, over the last sort of you know 11, 12 years, we've spent seven million dollars investing back into the into the farm, and and a lot of that is on on those key areas. Just just with the water, water's probably been the major one. Um, in 2007, when I turned up, there was 1,500 hectares of those of the farm, the land area um, of the 3,000, well, yeah, the 5,000 hectares that we couldn't graze at all. It was completely all the dams were dry. If you put stock into those into those areas, um, they would go straight to the little dam, which was dry with a little bit of mud in the middle, and just get stuck. Um, my first job, there was some freshly shorn tutus that had been put in a paddock. I went to go and have a look at them. There was about 300 in the stuck in a dam, sort of about a third of the size of this room. And every time you went in to grab one and pull one out, the other side they were trying to come in to get the little puddle of water in the, in the centre. And after after spending about three or four hours, you know, stripped off them and trying to get these sheep out. Um, decided pretty quickly that if we wanted to actually do anything, we needed to address one of our biggest limiting factors, which was water. Um, and so I guess 10 years on, we now sort of have, yeah, the whole area is, is completely troughed and reticulated. So um, it's been about a two and a half million dollar investment. Um, we use a variety of different methods, or well, water sources. So one, the main one's a river. So we pump out a river to high points and gravitate back down into troughs. Um, we have a couple of lakes, or one lake, that we use, and on a block that's just come on in the last four years, we've actually built our own dam, um, and then we pump out of that dam to the top of the hill and then gravitate from there. The change has been been amazing. Um, both, you know, it's, it's a real hard one to, to justify on a return on investment, but, um, you know, we, we sort of, we say it's about sort of 30, 30 to 35 percent return on investment, having that water. Better grazing management, um, subdivision, stock health. Um, and one of the things which people don't realise is actually the stress on staff in the summer, pulling sheep out of dams and water running out and where are you, where are you going to take your sheep to next or where are your cows going to go. And it's just, it was just a constant stress and a constant worry. So that's something that's been, a, been probably a real major a change in, 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 in the way we run the farm. 
Um, I probably should have put people first because I, I think that, you know, if I did this again, I'd have people first. People are the number one key um, factor within the business because if you haven't got people, we can't do it. Um, as I, in my management career, I managed smaller farms to build up to this, to this job. And, you know, a lot of those farms and only 20,000 stock units, you just about had a push, could, you know, run yourself ragged and you could just about get around and you could keep a good handle on everything. But as you start getting bigger and bigger in scale, you have to rely more and more on people. And so, um, it's, I mean, it's a huge challenge. We started with a really traditional um, labour force. Um, I, th I was 32 and I had three shepherds that were 65. Um, and they'd been there for 35 years. And whilst they didn't say boy to me, um, that's pretty much what they, they thought. You knew that's what they were thinking. Um, and you were trying to bring in some different ways of doing things. And whereas, you know, I, I came from, I, I didn't think that rotationally grazing stock was a, you know, that was just, a, that should be a normal thing. But they had never, ever done that before. It had been set stocked. And so it was a matter of actually showing them how to do it, you know, and then they, they were, yeah, it was a real challenge. It, um, for five years there, battled and battled. They were determined not to leave, and then they were um, determined to outlast the, the young fella. But <laughs> long story short, they didn't. Um, so, but yeah, it was just a really a real challenge. But it's not just the it's the it's the new people as well that you get in and and trying to um, really important to training of training them. So we spend a lot of money on training, and we encourage all our staff to train and upskill. Um, I think the other thing is, and probably where we need to probably get a bit better at is empowering them and and um, and then trying to retain them and and have that, have that succession running through our business. We do to a management level, so three of our four managers under me, that they've all started as shepherds, so that's great. But when you get a manager's job and, you know, you, you sort of stay there for five or six years, you know, these guys, and so then you haven't, then suddenly your succession's gone, you've got a lot of young guys that are coming through that need to step into those roles, and so it's a real big challenge, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, um, you, know, uh, you know, later on. Keeping them happy too. Um, that's, um, that, that's a big challenge. We try and include them in everything that we do, um, so we try and get around and so they can see all the blocks. We're, we are a big, big business, so everyone can actually understand what we're trying to do. Um, so just on the, on the sheep, 60% of our stock units are sheep, so we've got a few of those. Um, as I mentioned, 35,000 Romney ewes, uh, 20,000 go to a Romney uh, ram and, and the balance to, to Suffolk. We've had a big focus on, um, on genetics. One of our biggest limiting factors um, where we are is, uh, is facial eczema. And um, current, you know, the current management had no real breeding objectives around facial eczema. So we pretty much only had a natural uh, resistance. So by, by selecting basic, you know, FE, FE gold type rams and, in, and in improving those genetics, we've, that's been the, probably the biggest lift for our, for our lambing percentage. So we've taken it from 100% to 140 um, and I'd say it's driven around a lot around that eczema, eczema tolerance. As I mentioned, all our ewes are EID tagged, and so we do a lot of monitoring. Um, we introduced he uh, hogget mating, so we, ate, we made our hoggets, everything over 40, 40 kilos goes to the ram. So we currently it's about 5,000 out of the 8,000 that we winter. Um, we breed a lot of lambs, and so we've gone from 19,000 lambs in 2007 to 53,000 this last, last year. That has its challenges. Um, and um, so we're looking at ways and means to grow our business to, to actually finish those lambs. And we're involved in a couple of AI programs, both uh, with Merino Genetics um, and also, also Romney and, and, and creating our own multiplier uh, Romney flock to breed our own rams. So just in some, yeah, I mean, our, our sheep performance on a sheep stock, stock unit basis has, has nearly doubled in the last, um, in the last 11 years. On the cattle side, um, six and a half thousand cattle, um, of which two and a half thousand are breeding cows. Um, 1,500 of those cows to, to Ang Angus bulls and a thousand to Simital. We're also part of the beef progeny test, so we AI up to 1,200 cows um, commercially um, as part of that progeny test. And then we follow those progeny right through to slaughter um, and also back into the herd on the heifer side and then monitor all the different um, attributes around that. I guess the if you don't know about the progeny test, I guess the driving fat force behind that was to basically to prove to farmers that EBVs actually work and can add some value to your business. Um, believe it or not, there's lots of farmers that don't believe in EBVs at all, and they just buy um, buy on phenotype rather than genotype or, or a mixture of both. So it's a, it's been really interesting. It's been a little bit frustrating, um, but yeah, it's something that we're still sort of sort of working through. It's artificial insemination has been a great 
um, innovation for us. If we weren't in part of the progeny test, I, I would still be AIing 1,200 cows. The gain, the genetic gain you can get out of it is just um, huge, and it's actually a lot cheaper than what you think. Uh, we also have heifer mate, so that was never done before up, up there, so we've been heifer mating for the last 12 years. Um, I guess our next real big step for us is around, is it, is it, is around genomics and using some of this genomic technology and, and see if we can actually speed up our genetic gain even more. So once again, our cattle performance has sort of mirrored the, mirrored the sheep um, and nearly, nearly doubled. Um, I just thought I'd do a little, just a quick little thing around some branding and marketing. We had an opportunity to supply our local um, supermarket. So it was a bit of a joint venture of Wilson Hallabies in Auckland. And um, we did it, we don't do it anymore. We did it for two years, um, 52 weeks of the year. They were the numbers we put through, it wasn't huge numbers. Um, we were part of a farm IQ focus farm, so it was a way of us using our, our EID and, and some of the work that we've been doing and, and following that traceability and, and helping to tell a story uh, through to the consumer. Um, you know, it, it was great, you know, to get some branding, some co-branding onto a supermarket shelf, and I think we really thought we'd, you know, we'd cracked it. And I think it's always been a sort of a dream to, for a lot of farmers that I've spoken to anyway, to, to, to go from pasture to plate. Um, the reality, unfortunately, is that it's, um, we were probably supplying the wrong supermarket, being the lowest price um, retailer or whatever their slogan is, and pack and save. Um, but it was good learnings for us as a business. It, it, ended up, it cost us quite a bit to do it, so it was costing us about $25,000 a year uh, for the privilege of doing it. Um, that was basically just in lost um, schedules. But it was a good opportunity to get that on the shelf, learn how to do it, and I think it's something that we've, we've parked that at the moment. Um, but it's something that I think you know we'll we'll look at maybe maybe doing in the future. Um, some of the innovations so I've talked a little bit about some of this. Um, yeah, we were a farm IQ focus farm. We've also been a beef and lamb demonstration farm. Um, we've we have about we have had at any one point in time 14 on farm trials going on at the same time. I don't, I'm not saying that's a good idea. It's not actually. Um, it's a lot of work. It's uh, I just probably I get quite. I still do too, you get quite passionate about things and trying things and, and, and happy to if someone comes along and says, hey, would you do this with us? And we sort of say, say yes most of the time. Um, we do a lot of monitoring, um, weather stations, soil moisture strips. It's really important for us to monitor our soil moisture. Um, our weather stations are linked to the cloud, so I can look them up on my phone um, and we can see and monitor you know, what's happening there. Every 15 minutes it sends a, it sends a reading to the cloud and you can then look it up on your phone. And for us, soil moisture is probably the most important one, especially in the summer. And if we can monitor trends, um, we can then actually market stock earlier and just sort of beat that store rush um, if, we're, if we're moving into a real, um, into, a soil, into a soil moisture deficit. So that's, I mean, that's been really important. Um, yeah, I talked a bit about rest. Um, being a Marion corporation, I guess the environment's extremely important and how we, manage, how we manage the land and how we're going to leave that land into the future. So um, obviously we, we, we do a lot of we nutrient budgets. Um, we have a sort of a gold standard land environment plan, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that later on, but part of that has identified areas that, of, our, of our land that we need, to, we need to address. So we've just recently retired 430 hectares of our coastal um, country. Um, so basically all our coastline, we have 25 kilometres of coastline, that's all retired, all fenced, and it's just been retired this, um, this February. Um, I mean, it, it was a big call. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's area that needs, it, it's basically if it's cliff faces, um, sort of erodible country, we were still grazing it, we weren't intensively grazing it, we weren't um, really, in, you know, but it was, it was, it was used. Um, but we made a commitment to, to basically to, to basically subdivide, or, yeah, fence all that off, retire it, and then in the future we'll look at actually planting it. So in a couple of years we'll get in there and start planting it out in natives. So it's, it's, it's the idea is to return it back to more of its, na its natural state. Um, the shareholders are right behind that. Um, they really want to see their land being looked after. And, um, and so, yeah, they've, they've really, really supported us. Um, we've also had a couple of wetlands that we've just recently fenced off, so 10 hectares of wetland that we're, it's actually getting planted today, one of the wetlands, um, as part of our community project. We plant about 2,500 trees annually, mostly poplars and willows, um, and, and that alone is quite a big undertaking. I'll talk a little about the McDonald's in a minute. Um, 
part of our local council um, freshwater plan is that all our waterways need to be fenced off by 2021. So we've made a start on that already. Just to give you an idea, that's about $500,000 worth of fencing for us to, to fence off our waterways. Um, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's a major undertaking, but once again, I think you know, we, we, need to be, we need to be doing it. Um, yeah, and a lot of weed and pests. We spent about $200,000 on weed and pests, mostly blackberry and uh, variegated thistles. Uh, partnerships, I just, just quickly on partnerships, I think partnerships are really important, have been really important to us um, and are into the future, having close, transparent partnerships. Um, you know, we'll, 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 yeah, that's the list of the most of them there. And one of the biggest ones has been the local district council, having a good relationship with them. Um, 12 years ago, they weren't even allowed on the farm. So they were seen as regular reg regulators. They were just, they were gonna bring regulations onto us. It was gonna cost us money, keep them out, and at all means. Um, I think it's changed quite a bit now. We have a really good relationship with, with the district council and we try and get them on board with a lot of these different projects with the, you know, plant, fencing off the coastal country, um, planting waterways, things like that. And um, that's just, I thought of that, well, you can sort of see some of that coastal country. So a lot of that's been fenced off. You see those steep cliffs. So that's the sort of the country. You, you can still graze sheep on it. You probably the stocking rate of about five or six to the hectare is how we were running it. But yeah, so a lot of that country is now being um, now being retired. Um, and that's just the overall business. So that's that's where we came. So in 2007, when I was when I was called a boy, um, and and where we've managed to come to. This, it's obviously a squigglier line than that, um, but it has been a pretty big um, a pretty big increase. So McDonald's. Got a, we got approached um, about four, five year, four and a half, five years ago um, by McDonald's, Silverfin Farms and, and Beef and Lamb. Um, and it was around doing a project with McDonald's to look at how can we be more sustainable in our beef systems in New Zealand. So um, they came out and they said that the consumer expectation is that we are being more sustainable. Um, their global strategy was that they want to have all their products um, to be sourced from sustainable um, means um, by, by 2030, and they were going country by country looking at developing these models. So they asked us whether we'd be interested, and we said, yeah, um, definitely. We had to, we started looking at how can we separate our beef out to, to look at their beef systems, and realised pretty quickly that we couldn't. We were so integrated, and most of our sheep and beef farms are pretty much integrated when you start analysing them. So we had to look at a whole farm system. Um, so we came up, we need, and then we need to look at land environment plans, how we manage our lands, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was the, that was the start of getting us, we, we, I mean, we had a piece of paper that was a land environment plan. It was about three or four pages. Um, it was, it, it ticked the boxes. And unfortunately it was just a box ticking exercise with it. Um, and I think this made us really analyze a lot more. And so our, our land environment plans now, it, they see the highest standard they can be. We've analyzed every single paddock by paddock across eight and a half thousand hectares. I've checked out all the, the soil structure, um, the slope, um, anything you can possibly think of has been, has been analysed. Um, and so we thought we were, we ticked those boxes, we did this project and, and we just thought basically McDonald's, you know, just show us the money. We were going we to be supplying direct to McDonald's, we were going to be making, making, um, making our fortune. The reality is um, that wasn't the way it was at all. And McDonald's... Um, McDonald's are trying to just basically get us to change. We, need, we actually need to lift our bar as, as farmers. The bar of what ex consumers expect used to be here, it's now lifted to here. The consumer's not going to pay any more for that, unfortunately. And um, it doesn't matter how, how much we complain about it. We, we, we need to lift all our... our um, we need to lift the way we actually manage our properties, the land environment plans, you know, welfare, everything. We need to lift that standard across the board. Um, to meet the consumer expectations. Otherwise, we're going to get someone else, some other country's going to come along and, and, and they're going to do that and they're going to take over. Um, we were given the opportunity, we, we had a McDonald's audit across our business, which was a pretty scary sort of thing. It's a complete <coughs> audit of the whole business. Anyone involved in McDonald's has to have an audit. Um, so we're doing everything from a social, right down to a social audit. So they would come and interview all our staff and analyze every aspect of the business, which was, was yeah, it was quite intense. Um, we've. We were then offered to become a flagship farm for sustainability, which is a you know, great honour. It was the first one outside the EU. Um, also invited to the conference and, and the opportunity to get up, you know, talk about being scared to speak public speaking, get up and sort of be part of a panel talking in front of um, potentially 23,000 people was a bit, yeah, was a bit scary. Um, 
and I think just with McDonald's, it's just I think I really see them as being a, a global influencer. You know, they really influence influence the world. Right, so I'm five minutes. Um, I just I just wanted to quickly touch on a few things, and I'll try and whiz, whiz through them. Um, just that I just thought I'd, I reckon the pressure's on us as farmers, and, and you guys all know that. Um, and there's just a few things that I thought, um, you know, and I, and I notice on in the agenda you, you're going to be talking about them a bit later on. But you know the the inclusion of methane in the proposed net net carbon net zero carbon bill, you know can't be offset. Um, makes up three quarters of our ag emissions. Um, I guess the big issue for us to actually reach that target, um, we have to destock because that's the only way we can do it. So the cost to our business would be four hundred thousand a year to destock seven and a half thousand stock units. Um, and I just think um, I, I actually spoke at a at a conference and. A, um, the minister was there, and I, one of the things I said to him was that it would be great. It's all right for the, for, you know, for the government to come along and place regulations there. You know, it's, it'll be really good too if they actually helped us find ways and means for us to, to reach these goals. It's all right to put that on a bit of paper, but um, how are we going to do it? Yeah, and I just thought I'd include a few of these. It, 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 it's something that, you know just annoys me. You know, um, we ha we have an issue, and they talk about a, an urban and. Um, a rural and urban divide. Well, it's not actually a divide. It, it's a blimmin' chasm between the understanding and the urban urban areas. I put this one here up. This is actually from Doug Doug Avery. Um, and the reason I put it up there is because in Gisborne and in a lot of towns in New Zealand and Auckland included, when the um, because the septic systems aren't up to speed, when you get more than 70 mils of rain in a 12-hour period, they dump they open up the gates and they they dump it out into the sea. And then they put up little signs around these pristine um, Gisborne beaches and say, no, don't swim seven days. They don't tell you why you don't want to swim, but the reason is because there's raw liquid sewage out in the bay. Now, that's okay. You know, that's what this is. This is the, this is the issue that we've got. And we don't, you know, we, yeah, they, they were more worried about a cow, um, you know, defecating in a, in a creek than, um, than the fact that we've actually got raw untreated sewage dumped out in, into the bay. Um, I think... You know, one thing is about New Zealand farmers is that when something comes along, we always we are actually pretty proactive. We actually are trying to find solutions. I just think we need a little bit more support. New Zealand used to be a leader in, in ag research. Well, not not anymore. It's all user pays. If you want to get any research, you you've got to pay for it. Um, they tell you, um, you know, the latest thing is plant. You know, plant more trees. That's going to solve all our. That'll solve our problems. Um, and I'm not I'm not saying that we don't shouldn't be planting trees because we're planting a lot of trees. Um, and, and it's the right tree in the right place. But this is Tolaga Bay um, on June the 4th last year. And this is the same beach um, two days later after 200 mils of rain. Now, that slash is not like that now. It's all piled up at the top at the high tide mark in big, big piles. And it's just sitting there. And they're trying to burn it, but they can't. Um, and so no one's really worked out what's actually going to happen to that. But that is something that is, is an issue. And, on the east coast, in our region, um, we, we're sustainable now. The, the, the tree planting that was done back in Cyclone Bowler after that, you know, th that event, there's now enough trees planted that are in. It's a full cycle. We can be planting and felling for, for sustainable for, forever now in our region. We have 150 logging trucks trundle past our gate every day, full. And in their wisdom, our roads are terrible. Um, you ever talk to my wife about our roads up in Gisborne? Terrible. Um, they, in their wisdom, they decided to lift the, uh, the the weights, the tonnages of the trucks from I think it's from 42 ton to 53 or something like that. So now, so now it's just it's it, our roads just dis, uh, disintegrating. Um, but you know, there's yeah. Meanwhile, there's subsidies and the, you know people are being encouraged to and these forestry companies are being encouraged to plant out these farms. <coughs> Hundred thousand stock units in the Wairapa is dropping out and being planted in trees. Now, right now. Um, so I think it's an issue, uh, and I don't know whether it's being addressed. I mean, th this issue we're looking at here is to do with the fact that trees were planted where they probably shouldn't have been planted, and they didn't actually look at how they were going to harvest them. And that's basically skid sites and slash or wash down the river. Um, people sort of touched on that a little bit. Um, you know, who's going to be our future farmers and whose responsibility it is to find them? And I believe it's our responsibility as farmers to find who's going to be our future farmers, and no one else is going to unless we do. Um, ageing population, um, I, I don't think there's enough promotion in our, in our industry, of our industries and the opportunities that are there. And it's something that I'm really quite passionate about to try and get more young people into, into, into agriculture. Otherwise, you know, 
people are going to be selling them, um, selling farms and trees at the moment is, is where a lot of farms are being sold to. Synthetic protein, I mean, I do think it's quite a big threat. Um, it's a bit of a growth industry. You have to question their story um, compared to ours. And I believe that, you know, there's always going to be a market for the real thing in the world. And so I think we just need to make sure we focus on actually producing as good a product as we can um, to, to, to feed that market. Animal welfare, um, a real big issue. If you Google animal welfare, and I'll show you some of the things that came up when I Googled animal welfare, and it sort of it scares you a little bit. I, I guess we're up against some really big, big, big businesses, really. Um, I call them businesses, but big, you know, entities that are really driving um, anti-farming. Um, you know, this is the sort of stuff, and it comes about animal welfare around wool. So um, some people still believe that sheep are killed to get the wool. And this is the stuff they're looking at. And I mean, look, there are some bad practices out there, don't get me wrong, but I think we really, there's a lot of really extremely good practices, and I think we need to counter the, we need to counter the, you know, the negative with some positive stories. <laughs> um, I'm definitely not an expert on, on this, but just with a lot of pressures that are on us um, around our health and well-being and mental health and depression, and, and I know everyone, you know, it's, 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 it is talked about a lot, which is great. I just think we really need to be making sure, just wanted to reiterate it, you know, I'm no expert on it, but we actually really need to look out for everybody, um, each other and everybody within our businesses. But also, um, I think you actually need to be keeping an eye out. Like, if you're at the top of, you're the boss, you need to be keeping an eye out and who's looking after you as well. And, you know, maybe sometimes stop and have a look at yourself in the mirror and, and just check. Um, yeah, I'm running out of time. Um, just quickly, genetic decisions. I think there's huge opportunity in genetics, um, and I think a genetic decision you make today, and what ram and what and what bull you put in into your flock or into your herd, is basically is going to affect your business and your profitability, your performance and profitability for the next, at least the next ten years. And I don't think us, I don't think I don't think farmers focus enough on on, on that. As a farmer, there's not many things that you have 100% control over in your businesses and the farm. You know, there's, we're under, you know, but, but genetics and the decision on what ram and what bull you put in is 100% your decision, and it can have a huge, huge um, influence moving forward. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think technology, uh, you know, there's, there's huge opportunities, um, and where will we be in another five years? And I think that's really exciting. Um, I've sort of challenged, um, especially people, you know, Ag research and new seed companies is what's the new what's going to be the new forage? I mean, currently we use a lot of plantain. We've got four or five hundred hectares of plantain. Well, that started as a roadside weed. I'd really like to know what's the other. You know, we really need to be sort of driving that. And the sad thing is, there's there's no real government funding or support for that sort of research currently, and it's actually a big issue. So yeah, just, I'll just yeah, just nearly finished tomorrow, Richard. <laughs> You're not growling at me yet. Um, I think, just in summary, I mean, think outside the square. I think if you if you accept people telling you that you can't do stuff, well, then you you, you know you'll just fall into the into the inside the square. And I think there's huge opportunity to think outside the square. Um, people management is probably number one. Um, another big important one is utilising the tools and the experts. The return on investment can be huge. And and what I mean by that is to get get an expert in for fifteen hundred dollars to say analyse your fertiliser applications or um, things like that, the return on that investment can be huge regardless of the size of your business. So I'd encourage farmers to, to utilise those experts because the returns can be can be huge. A little bit of R&D within your business. We're a big business, we have a big budget, um, and so we actually have an R&D budget. But I believe that all farms, regardless of size, could be doing a little bit of R&D within their business and having a look at some things. And believe it or not, there's lots of scientists that are looking for farmers that they can help and do some joint projects on, on a whole wide range of things. And I mean, beef and lamb have, um, you know, an, uh, the innovation farmer type concept where you can actually get some funding and support to do some innovative idea and have a crack at some R&D. So I just encourage farmers to really, really have a crack at that. A lot of measuring, a lot of monitoring. Genetics, I talked about. Collaboration and, and communication. You know, that's something that our industry really needs across, across everything. We need to be coming together and, and, and being, and, you know, Collaborating and communicating. And at the end of the day, somewhere along there, you've also got to be having some fun because, um, yeah, farming is actually a lot of fun. So I've just got a little video. How do I get that started? And then I'm done. Sound.
At Farmer Our Farms, we're really trying to produce what the consumer wants and demands. And I guess decisions we make on farm today, um, and, and, and with our genetics, with our breeding, and with our stock sort of finishing policies, we're actually looking ahead. We think that the, that the consumer is wanting a grass-fed, hormone-free, antibiotic-free, um, or you know, a, an animal that's been looked after, it's had its welfare taken care of, you know, it's had a good life, we're, we're environmentally aware, and, and that, that's the sort of products that we're looking at, at producing. What attracted me here was um, I'm from here, from Whangara, so just a natural progression to come on as, a, as the boy when I first started and work my way up through the ranks. An opportunity to uh, come and work on land that my grandfathers and fathers and that have worked on was yeah, the Uh, sustainability for us at Whangarau Farms is really important um, for if we want to, you know, for, for it to be here for our kids when we um, when we move on. You know, this land's going to be, was farmed for the last hundred years, it's going to be farmed for the next hundred, you know, that's how we want to leave it. These lands will always be here, they can never be sold. Decisions we make today and the way we treat the land today are, are basically going to affect um, the future generations and so it's, it's, you know, we have got to be really mindful of that when we, when we come to making, making those decisions.